Good evening. Welcome, everybody, to the British Library. It's wonderful to see a packed theatre here tonight at the Pickett Theatre. Uh, I'm Roly Keating. I'm chief executive here at the BL, and we couldn't be happier to be gathering here tonight to celebrate the genius of Terry Pratchett. Um, welcome to all of you, of course, um, but welcome also to countless others out there on the internet watching online, and in particular a shout-out to our friends in libraries, hooray for libraries across the UK, thank you, in our, our living, exactly right, our living knowledge network, our partners, and tonight we've got audiences tuning in, I think they used to say, in Leeds, Cambridge, Bournemouth, Jersey, Farnborough, Guildford, and Glasgow. Um, so welcome to the virtual community of the British Library. Tonight, tonight's celebration of the late great Terry, Sir Terry Pratchett, is of course part, one of the highlights, of a season of events we're putting on all through the next few months to coincide with our exhibition, our major exhibition at the moment, called Fantasy Realms of Imagination. And I hope some of you have had a chance to see it. I hope many of you will have a ch multiple chances to see it because you cannot possibly see it all at once. You have to keep going around and finding out, finding out more. It's a long cherished project here um, by our team of curators to explore the roots, the history, the diversity of the thing we call fantasy, particularly through the literary tradition, um, but actually drawing in all the different kinds of media that fantasy expresses itself in. Um, we are a library. So if you do go and see it, um, you will find manuscripts, of course, manuscripts by everyone from Mervyn Peake, Angela Carter, the Bronte sisters, uh, Lewis Carroll, uh, not to mention that very key manuscript of Beowulf. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have Beowulf ever if it weren't for that document and it's on display in the show. And alongside those, of course, is the huge richness of contemporary fantasy with wonderful loans, including uh, the Coraline notebook from Neil Gaiman himself, uh, not to mention artworks, costumes, films, videos, games, uh, and much, much more. This week, as well as being part of our fantasy season, of course, is also the 40th anniversary of the first Discworld novel, uh, and we're delighted it coincides with a relatively rare flying visit from Neil Gaiman to London. And we're very grateful to Neil for joining us tonight. He will be in conversation um, alongside Sateri's biographer, former assistant, and co-director with uh, Rihanna Pratchett uh, of his estate, uh, Rob Wilkins. And you're gonna be hosted by the writer and journalist, Kat Brown. There will be a chance for questions at the end um, and if you're watching online, there should be a sort of widget below the video screen where you can post questions and we'll try and capture and, and hopefully ask some of those as well. And for those of you in the room, there will, this being a library and a bookshop, be books for sale afterwards. Should, should there be any books you haven't already got? Um, so without further ado, please can I welcome our speakers to the stage. Enjoy the evening. Thank you. I feel a little bit like we're still in COVID times, but hello over there, hello, and hello to all of you as well. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, not the least because you sold it out so bloody quickly that I couldn't have got a ticket otherwise. Um, <laughs> But even more so that Rob has worn the man from Del Monte jacket in <laughs> honour of that author photo. You know, say yay and you know, say on, good omens. On the back cover of Good Omens, um, the original Good Omens showed me in black with a leather jacket and Terry in white which was Terry's theory was that way, if anybody got bricks through their window, <laughs> it would be me, because people would think he was the good one because he was wearing white, except he did not own a white jacket at that point. And our, the managing editor of 
Golang's books, Malcolm Edwards had to lend him <laughs> um, a white jacket. And we're standing there freezing in February in uh, Kensal Green Cemetery in front of somebody's tomb, now bricked up, by the way. Uh, mm possibly because too many people were turning up to get their photos taken in front of it. And uh, Terry was wearing, just looking just like that. Um, it's Malcolm a stunning still, recreation. Malcolm still complains that he didn't hang on to the jacket and sell it. <laughs> as... I mean, questions also need to be asked about why Malcolm owned that suit in the first place, <laughs> but never mind. Um, we are, of course, here with Rob Wilkins and Neil Gaiman. Um, that is a sort of a completely superfluous introduction. We all know why we're here, but just for the sake of somebody who's just wandered in and gone, this looks nice, how wonderful. <laughs> Rob, though, I do know that you wanted to bring something else onto the stage to begin with. Well, we are, I, I, I pointed out to Rob that while we too are here assembled, um, we're missing somebody. There is somebody else who we are here for, to talk about and who we personally miss, which is Terry. And Rob said that he thought he could do something about that. Yeah, let me sort mm. this out, honestly. Here we go, here we go. Talk amongst yourselves, just for one moment. I'll pour water. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. This is me performatively pouring water. <laughs> there we go. Uh, We're all a oh. bit closer now, that's lovely. There he is. I remember that leather jacket. <laughs> Not sure I remember that particular hat, but he got through so many of them. That's an Australian Akubra. The Australian Discworld Convention gave it to him, and they were a little bit nervous that it wasn't his usual fedora. And uh, it became his favourite. It uh, very, very quickly became his favourite. So, yes, we have the Australian Discworld Convention mm. to thank for the hat. Well, what about starting off with a little bit about how you first met, not necessarily the leather jacket, but the man <laughs> in the succession of leather jackets? Neil, what are your first well, memories? Well, I, I met Terry a little bit before Rob did. I, I mean, my first encounter with Terry, I remember the sequence went... I read a Dave Langford review of uh, Color of Magic in White Dwarf. And I think I'd already read Strata um, and The Dark Side of the Sun. Um, but this sounded interesting. This sounded like something else. And then one day I turned on Woman's Hour. <laughs> um, and they went over to the serialized story on Woman's Hour, which for reasons known only to women, um, was The Color of Magic. And I thought, this is really fun. This is lovely. And um, tried to figure out how you get a copy. Because at the time, I went into Forbidden Planet, and they were out. And apparently, there'd been a run on them following Woman's Hour. <laughs> um, and then I got sent an advanced copy, which made me incredibly happy, and um, of the paperback. And I was asked if I would like to interview Terry Pratchett. I was, I was a young freelance journalist writing for everybody. And amongst the everybody was an English science fiction magazine called Space Voyager. Um, and I said, absolutely, I would love to. What I didn't know was that Terry had never been interviewed before. <laughs> so he turned up at this lunch. I love the fact, by the way, that, that for years, Terry and I would tell people it was a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> and we believed it was a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> when we filmed the memorial to Terry, it was in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> um, and I'm there in the Chinese restaurant. And uh, very shortly after filming that memorial, I found my desk diary. <laughs> for 1985, and there I am in January 1985 uh, in Bertarelli's in Gouge Street, <laughs> meeting Terry Pratchett for lunch at an Italian restaurant. It's like, curses. Um, 
It must have been a very good lunch. I, it's the only lunch where I remember nothing at all of the food on either side. Um, all I remember is the conversation. I remember that we made each other laugh. I remember that we, we hit it off in a really sort of profound and bizarre way. Um, at the point where we were swapping gags, and I was talking about the fact that, you know, my parody of the, um, the, the Necronomicon was going to be the Liber Paginarum Fulvarum, or the Book of Yellow Colored Pages. <laughs> and Terry's like, mine is going to be the Necrotelecomnicom. <laughs> and it's like we were thinking we had the same kind of minds that did the same kind of things. Um, we, I took some photos of him. We walked down to FP and I took some terrible photos of him. It was the only time anybody ever let me take photos for a magazine and I was rubbish at it, but it's my, I have a little photo of Terry in that Space Voyager. Describe that photo. In particular, describe the jumper or the sweater, I should say, that Terry wore. Uh, yes, Terry is wearing an unlikely sort of sweater. Uh, festive, you could practically say. Yes. <laughs> a festive sweater and a sort of a black thing that on his head that is not exactly a hat. It's not quite a beret. Oh, God. It sort of looks like an alien, small alien creature <laughs> went around the world looking for a place to land and, and it's on Terry's head. And on Terry, he looks vaguely as if he possibly has a sort of some very strange secondary careers with that hat, with <laughs> his black leather hat. Um, but he's not yet Terry Pratchett. Mm. This is the first ever interview. He was so much more honest with me than he ever was in later <laughs> interviews. Bless his car. I mean, you know, he, in later interviews, he learned things to say. Mm. In that first interview, he's just telling me how he thinks about things, mm. uh, which is much more revealing and I think much more interesting. Um, and then we sort of stayed friends after that interview. Um, we'd run into each other at conventions. The next time I saw him was a few months later and um, he started telling me he'd just finished or was finishing writing Equal Rights, if memory serves, and he He's telling me about equal rights, he's telling me the plot, and he was telling me the next book he was gonna write. And the next book he was gonna write was going to be a long earth book. He'd come up with this idea of, of the long earth, and uh, he was incredibly proud of it, and he told me about it at enormous length, and how he was finally going to be taken seriously as a science fiction writer. <laughs> he had his thing, and at the end of Terry's talk, he said, um, I said to him, I said, well, that sounds very nice, but you should write a book with death in it because he's your best character. Mm. <laughs> and he said, I don't think so. I'm going to be doing this thing and this long earth. <laughs> and about a week later, my phone rang and I picked up the phone and a voice simply said, you bastard, it's called Mort. <laughs> <laughs> Put down the phone. And then the phone rang again about 15 minutes later and I picked it up. He said, don't you go telling everybody it was your idea. <laughs> and indeed to this day, and Rob yes. has seen it, I have a proof copy of Mort, which Terry gave me, which is signed to Neil Gaiman in the hopes that he won't tell everybody it was all his idea. <laughs> Well, on behalf of basically 41 amazing books and 40 incredible years, thank you very much for steering him <laughs> away from the long earth until just then. I mean, it seems absolutely crackers that we're here to celebrate all things Terry, really, but also like 40 years since The Colour of Magic was first printed. I mean, it's been a, a fairly busy year for all things Pratchett. Um, and it just continues to get busier. And it just continues yeah. to get busier, just right up until Christmas. We're sort of thinking about 
like, I mean, everything from stamps to obviously the second season of Good Omens to Rihanna's gorgeous Tiffany Aching book with Gabrielle Kent, which is a miracle. I hope everybody here has seen it. It's wonderful. The kickstart of the graphic novel, those amazing audio books, which always sort of get a little bit forgotten because obviously we've got the printed books, but are just bringing everything they to life. They are brilliant. I'm yeah. just going to jump in at that point. Yeah. I'm just going to say um, one of my goddesses is in the room tonight. Alice, you, you are here. Um, she is just brilliant. She, Alice, will come to you and say, so the voice of death, who are you thinking? And you go, yeah, uh, well, short of, re uh, in fact, I'm going, I'm, I'm find myself saying, short of actually re reanimating Christopher Lee, and I've realised that's probably not beyond her abilities. <laughs> <laughs> A voice like Peter Serafanovich, that will, that will do, that will do. Two weeks later, you know, you were talking about Peter, yes, and you, you think then you're going to get a list a, B, C, and D, pick from one of those. But no, she just says, yes, I've got Peter. And she did it every single time with everybody she cast. And we, we got our A list every time. And for that, I am so eternally grateful. On behalf of Terry, I'm eternally grateful. Those audio books could not be better. No, they're extraordinary. And they I think are. for everybody who grew up with like the Stephen Briggs versions, even the sort of abridged Tony Robinson versions, you'd never have thought those could be beaten. But um, they've come pretty flipping close, I think, over, not over nostalgia. Um, what has your favourite way been that this anniversary has been celebrated this year? Uh, the publication of A Life with Footnotes. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, oh, and... Come on. <laughs> no. Well... But also, whilst we pick up that clanging, clanging <laughs> name drop there, um, uh, something about a Hugo Award fairly recently... And I think that actually does, that really does deserve it. Thank you. But let me say here and now, um, Terry didn't get a Hugo in his lifetime, during his lifetime. Um, he was up for the same category as me, um, best associated work. And uh, for one of the science, no, for the first science of Discworld novel. Mm -hmm. And he didn't win. He was then nominated for Going Postal. And in a very Terry way, actually withdrew his nomination because he thought the Discworld fans wouldn't actually be able to gather themselves together with enough muster for going postal to win, which is a ridiculous thing, but he didn't want it to ruin his weekend, so he didn't win. <laughs> I'm not joking. He said it would ruin his world, Con. Um, and so when A Life with Footnotes was nominated, it had no chance of winning, and when it won, um, I, it's, not, it's not false modesty, it's all Terry's. It's Terry's, it's Terry's story. It's Terry's. He's got a big picture on the front. It's Terry's. There you go. It's his, it's his win. But thank you for mentioning it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and a little bit of you as well. Terry, there, Rob. I mean, Terry yeah. took this strange, perverse... He, he managed to both be angry about never winning a Hugo and to take an enormous pride in never winning a Hugo. <laughs> After, after I'd won my first Hugo, he was like, you know, of course you won a Hugo, because you wear dark glasses sometimes, and you've got a full head of hair, Gaiman. <laughs> I'm a bald old bugger, and I will never win a Hugo, but I sell more books than you. <laughs> <laughs> and, it was the crossover that I don't think anybody saw coming when, at the very beginning of A Life in Footnotes, um, we had a very similar anecdote as to how um, Rob and Terry ended up meeting in the first place, and that was because the blockbuster author Jilly Cooper had a PA, <laughs> and Terry was like, well, if she's got one, why, why don't I have one? And then immediately managed to get on. What were your recollections of the first times that you met because you'd sort of met him in passing before, hadn't you? And yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd met him at signings. Up. Let's be completely clear here. I, am, I remain, I am still a huge fan of Terry's work, of the writing, of the books. Um, there's always a Terry Pratchett on the go. I read them for pleasure. I don't read them all the time just for, for the job. They, I, I love them. I still love them, and I'm still finding things in them mm. that will wake me up in the middle of the night. And you, I know you all have this. You'll wake up and you go, oh, bugger, wasn't, <laughs> wasn't he so incredibly clever? And I still get that even now. Well, the big one on Reddit in the last six weeks has been people noticing in pyramids that the embalmer is called Dill. Yeah. As in Dill Pickle. Yeah. There's a lot of people there just going, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> when you... Oh, 
obviously it is it, for the last sort of 20 odd years it has very much been your working life but I'm wondering if when you if either of you do ever pick up a Discworld novel to reread for pleasure which is the one that you would first go for after you um <laughs> it was interesting for me because I'd tend to reread for pleasure the later books um I went back and reread Mort itself when it was time to write an introduction to it. And I read it going, oh, you're still not grown yet. Mm. You're not quite, I'd, I'd sort of got very used to the Terry Pratchett who wrote The Thief of Time, who wrote Monstrous Regiment, who wrote Nightwatch. Um, I think that Terry Pratchett and that era of Terry Pratchett was one of our greatest writers. Mm. I think there was a humanity, there was a genius. He had actually learned how to harness humor to do real emotional damage. Mm. Um, <laughs> and in the first books, he's, he starts off just learning how to be funny yeah. and how, he, how you can be funny if you take fantasy seriously. And then he learns how to be, he goes, okay, well, you can just let the fantasy happen but if you let people be people, what would happen? And then there's a period where he starts going, what happens if you do this to the world? I've got Discworld, it's a fabulous place. I remember him ringing me up once and saying, here, um, I think I'm in trouble. I said, why? He said, well, I'm starting another Discworld book and it's another conversation with death. And I think this is becoming something I do because I've now done this at the beginning of like four books and I have to come up with another beginning. And I said, don't you dare. He said, why not? And I said, that would be like saying that, you know, at the beginning of a Jeeves and Worcester book, when Worcester comes out learning his ukulele or with a moustache or, or with a new bow tie that you know Jeeves hates and he has to lose by the end of the book, that, Woodhouse couldn't do that. Of course Woodhouse can do that. And Terry said, oh, all right, I will. <laughs> and he did it all the way to the end. Um, the, for me, those late period, that sort of mature, painful, brilliant Pratchett is the stuff that I will just go back to and revel in. I think Nightwatch is a work of genius. Yeah. Um, I think Monstrous Regiment is one of the most interesting books about the nature of both war and of gender. Mm. Mm. Um, and just as a little footnote here, I don't quite see how anybody could read Monstrous Regiment and then announce very loudly, as some twerp in The New Statesman did, <laughs> that they believed that Terry would have supported them and J.K. Rowling in all this idiocy about hating trans people. Um, you know, at the, at the point where they're saying things like, who are you gonna believe, his friends and his daughter, or me, who never met him? Um, it got, anyway, sorry. No, not round. at all, because of course, like Cherie Littlebottom would never, so. Um, again, it would really help if people like read things before saying things, but uh, that feels like an ongoing, ongoing issue. What about you, Rob? Which, which is your rereader? I have to say that Nightwatch definitely starts the period for me. Beyond, beyond Nightwatch, uh, anything I could be reading at any given time. Mm. A favourite of mine, for personal reasons, is Unseen Academicals. Um, some of you will have heard me say it before, that you will not find two blokes who know less about football than <laughs> and myself. I, I grew up with a family who would stop the car to watch two kids kicking a tin can down the road. This didn't rub off on me, but Terry realised that, well, he wanted to write the book about mm. football because he had the title, Unseen Academicals. So he was steering the narrative towards the title. And one day he burst through the office door and said, here, the thing about football it's not just about football. And then he reeled off. It's about the scarves, it's about the hats, it's about the chanting, it's about being in your gang and all of that. And, and 
unseen academicals changed on a sixpence. It changed, uh, we turned 90 degrees with it. And the thing is about that book is that it was, for me, it was the last novel that Terry was writing when he was actually firing on all cylinders. Mm. There was, he was still at the peak of his powers. And, and completely naively, uh, because the PCA, the, the embuggerance, was traveling so slowly, I felt that we, we would, we, we'd, we'd hit the bottom and it was going to take years before we would find him dropping off further. So for me, for personal reasons, I find that. But actually, I, I, I read, I've probably reread Nation Mm. Which um, he very—I I will say this out loud—he um, has reserved for Rihanna to uh, to adapt. No one else will get will get a look in on on, on that book other, other than Rihanna, and I'm incredibly um, proud to to say that. But the the end of Nation. Sorry about the spoiler if you if you haven't read Nation. But actually, if you haven't read Nation, why not? Is the, is the <laughs> I want to know at the end of Nation. The, the ending that I wanted. Somebody who and I can't believe I'm going to say this out loud. Who unashamedly loves a rom-com, okay, um, and I, I do like my Richard Curtis movies, and I wanted the ending where, if you can remember the jacket, the Johnny Duddle jacket cover, Mao is standing on the beach, you've got the dolphins, and he's standing there very proudly with his spear in the sand. I wanted that as the final shot of Nation, but what I wanted is another beat, and I wanted the boat coming over the horizon. I wanted at the moment where you, the, the reader, you didn't have to see anything beyond that, but you could believe that Daphne was coming back in, into, into Mao's life. And I wanted that. I wanted them to have a chance. We, we wouldn't find out what had happened over here in the alternative England, in the alternative London. We wouldn't find out about it. We didn't need to know that, but the old romantic in me, I needed to know that they were actually going to meet again. They probably had grandchildren bouncing on their knees. They probably lived an entire life but they were going to get back together. And do you know what he said? He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've given you all of that spiel. He said, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. And I kept banging on about wanting my ending. And I actually asked him, and, and I'm sure you would agree with him with this. He just kept saying no. Even when I begged him, just for me, can we write it? <laughs> so I've got it. So uh, yeah, to hell with you lot. I would, <laughs> I, would, I would know that Mao and Daphne got back together. I, I love the idea of Rob Wilkins inventing fan fiction all on his own. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. You heard it here first. Also, how lovely to add that to the coterie of the actual romances on Discworld as well, just the Rob Wilkins Just For Him edition of That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back to something, um, Neil, that you, sorry, un really unhelpfully, you said about five minutes ago, but it was about in Nightwatch when Terry really not only entered his stride, because his stride had been going for like decades by that point, but really just became the writer of literature, as he would have hated to be <laughs> referred to and that sort of thing. But I was particularly reminded of this because last week we lost A.S. Byatt, the author of Possession, among she loved many Terry others. She loved so Terry so much. We, we were on Radio 4 together, me and her, once, and we had to read our... It was some books programme, we had to read things, and... Um, Damn those we, <laughs> I don't know, we'd each, we'd each had to bring a favourite passage of literature and read it out and that kind of thing. And then the conversation just turned into me and A.S. by a geek out about Terry Pratchett for 40 <laughs> minutes. Um, and nobody stopped us. It was great. <laughs> this, is the, the, this is the thing, because even just looking back over some of the appalling non-Woman's Hour clips around Terry in the 80s and 90s, I mean, it's uh, quite astonishing. And so having somebody like A.S. Byatt and, and the others who did actually like write and endorse Terry and not a sort of like, oh, it's a guilty pleasure sort of way, but just like, no, this is proper writing, this is wonderful. Why is, why is the sort of ongoing thing that like enjoying yourself, how, why, why is that not literary? Why is that an unliterary thing? Why do we have to suffer when reading books <laughs> for that to be like, oh, it's a Booker Prize? It was the most fun you can have with your clothes on. That's yes. What Terry said, so there yeah. you go. I think there's a level on which um, one of the huge advantages that we got from Terry was that he was an autodidact. Mm. He discovered the joys of literature himself, and he discovered the joys of nonfiction himself, and he taught himself stuff, and he always followed the stuff 
he was interested in and that was fun and was enjoyable. Terry really didn't read a lot of things that he didn't enjoy. He just happened to enjoy an enormous number of different things. Um, and, you know, I got more book recommendations, discovered more new authors of fiction and of nonfiction from Terry than from any other human being in my life. Mm. Um, you know, the last time I saw Terry, but one, um, he was recommending a book to me. And I think, if memory serves, it was called Feeding Nelson's Navy. Yes, it was. And he was explaining to me that he just read this book about how a large naval ship filled with sailors and people working on the ship got fed because you've got hundreds and hundreds of people and where does the food come from and how does it work? And you could, A, his enthusiasm and love for this book and all of this knowledge was on the one hand, and B, um, it's still a source of heartbreak to me that because of the embuggerance, we didn't get this fabulous book of Discworld at Sea mm. that he would have written that would have been sort of a bit hornblower, you know, it would have been a bit C.S. Forrester, a bit all of the other great sea stories and he would have, and it would have been practical and real and hilarious. Mm. Um, and you knew that was coming, but he never got to write that. Mm. Yeah. One of the stories that was on the hard drive that got crushed after Terry passed away, crushed by some complete pillock, I would have to say. <laughs> um, One well, of those uh, pillocks in a steamroller. Oh yeah, you know what it's like. I know, know what it's like. like. Um, was going to be another Moist von Lidwig novel. Oh. And um, it was going to be called Running Water. And Moise von Litwig was going to become Joseph Bazalgette oh, no. in Ankh Morpork. Yeah. And we had, and it was through uh, Feeding Nelson's Navy, we were trying to work out how much stuff came into Ankh Morpork each day, but also, once it had been digested, how much stuff <laughs> left oh, God. Ankh Morpork after the digestion process. Yeah, particularly with the sausage in a bun, you've got a question. Oh. <laughs> you know, um, I, I, Terry didn't delete very much. The versions, Terry would send me his novels while he was writing them. Um, and they'd turn up on discs and in chunks. You know, here's 25,000 words of a book. Here's another 25,000 words of a book. Here's the last 25,000 words of the book. And, um, and normally the book that I would read would be the book that was published. The only bit that I really remember losing was in moving pictures. I know what you're going to say. I know. There was a long sequence where Terry had gone to Australia and he discovered the term Dunnikin Diver. <laughs> which, for those of you who are not Australian and didn't just chuckle, um, involve those whose job it is to basically manually clean out outside toilets and sewage systems. And there was a long sequence in the book where our hero had a failed job <laughs> as a Dunnikin diver <laughs> with his spade. <laughs> and that was gone when the book was published. And yep. I've always, I often think about you and your, you and your Steamroller yep. going, you know, it's not like, it could, you could have been like Christopher Tolkien and it could have been the Dunnikin Diver edition. And <laughs> I thought that everyone would look at me after that and, and say, yes, it was Terry's final wish. You, 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 you did him good. But actually, no, um, I mainly get wagging fingers when I talk about the well, all of the stories that, that, that we lost, all of the stories that were started, because um, I was going to dive in there and say we belong to the recyclable school of literature, so nothing got wasted. The um, Hunt the Maker Poet scene at the front of Unseen Academicals, Terry sent me off with my miner's hat on one day into the pit, which was our folder on our main writing machine, where all of the fragments went, which I guaranteed Rincewind's mum would have been in there as well. I, I remember Terry telling me about Rincewind's mum. Mm. He'd written several pages on Rincewind's mum. Yeah. And I kept waiting year after year for <laughs> Rincewind's mum to show up, and she never did. But everything would be in the pit, or would have been in the pit. <laughs> well, that's the thing, because that was the managing of the world. And I know that sort of later on, 
uh, there was quite a lot of outsourcing to people about what they knew in certain mm. ways in the order of the honeybee and everything. Yes. But that the world building around Discworld, like the, I mean, the fact that the more that we learn, we come back and go, oh no, that is actually an absolutely textbook replication of how one would build a clack system or something like that. Neil, you've obviously forged a world or two or 12 in your time. What does it take apart from bloody perseverance to be able to build well, a world successfully? I think um, what Terry did was actually in many ways different from what anybody else does when they world build. Because what Terry did was have a tremendous amount of fun making up stuff that sounded funny. And then realize, which is the equivalent of sort of, you know, trying to build a city out of candy floss and toffee. Um, and then suddenly realize that you actually need to use this to live in. So now you're buttressing it and painting it and making and figuring out ways that you actually can use your toffee and candy floss and what you need to build over it to turn it into something that you can use. I mean, the, you know, the truth. Terry had been talking about doing his newspaper novel um, for almost as long as I've known him. I think it was, he was working on it at least as far back as sorcery um, because we would have long conversations about it. And the long conversations were Terry explaining to me how newspapers had started and the idea that a newspaper, in, originally it was rich people sending their representatives to foreign countries and the rich person's representative would write them long letters back telling them what was going on and how that eventually transformed into the concept of the newspaper. And Terry really had this amazingly glorious nuts and bolts attitude to things and then used to get incredibly frustrated because he'd created a world in which he just made this stuff up in the first few books and now he had to actually yep. justify it while doing this stuff that had substance. Um, he'd get very grumpy about that. While never allowing magic to be the, uh, the key to making it work. So you yeah. mentioned the clack system. We actually set up the clack system using matchboxes and other bits and pieces cool. across the office floor yeah. because Terry was stumped at the point, what happens when a message cross, crosses? So what happens when it gets to a tower and the tower is receiving a message and trying to send the message at the same time? And we had to, we had to sit down and practically work out what would actually happen within that tower. He couldn't just make it up. He had to actually see it and then it'd be like, okay, light bulb moment, I've, I've got it. If it didn't work, it, it, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't allow it in. Though there is one anecdote I can tell you that came right at the end. Um, Terry was writing a, a book, one of the um, crushed um, fragments of a novel, uh, called The Turtle Stops. And we found out that Greater Turin is, is uh, unwell, um, possibly terminally unwell, um, critically unwell. And we need to work out how the wizards of Discworld have worked out that... that that a Turin is, is dying. And, and obviously, the, you, you don't need to, to be too clever to work out the metaphor there of what, what was happening in Terry's life and, and what he was pasting on a Turin. So um, he said, oh, it's going to be magical vibrations. I said, no, 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 Terry, magical vibrations. Nope, not having that, not having that. And he said, oh, OK, um, what we're going to do, we're going to send the wizards up the Tower of Art, and they're going to observe a Turin from the top of the Tower of Art. No, no Terry, no. We, uh, however tall the Tower of Art is, and we put a wizard at the top of it, they cannot see a Turin. And he's like, no, 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 I'm not having that, I'm not having that. And the more annoyed Terry would get, he wouldn't fold his arms, he would, he, his arms would go around himself, and I would see less of his face as his head went down, and the hat was now, there we go, I'm not, I'm not seeing much of Terry there. And, and we had just had lunch, and the latter years of Terry were powered by uh, Bubble and Squeak from the local pub. And we just had our Bubble and Squeak, so I cleared the, the remnants of his plate off. I got my plate. I took a pea from his, his plate, because I would never waste a pea. Uh, pea is now on my plate. So I've got a plate on my hand. 
and I've got a P in the center of the plate. I go, Terry, the P represents the Tower of Art and the, the wizards thereon. And my, wherever I move my hand, you might be able to just see a bit of thumb, let's say a chewing's nose, a little bit there, maybe my little finger. You might see a little bit of tail, but there is no way that from the top of the Tower of Art could the wizards of Discworld observe greater chewing. I rest my case. <laughs> and Terry had his head down. He was getting more and more annoyed. And he just looked up and he went, it's my effing universe. I can do what I effing want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and was he wrong? Like no, he wasn't. So, you no. Um, so we've got you and Terry in the office with matchboxes and being able to run through physical arguments plus also that. But r I spoke to Rihanna and Gabrielle about their Tiffany Aching book here recently and they were able to do it with Google Docs and Zoom and everything. <laughs> Neil, any thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, I, so the way that we wrote Good Omens um, is, and it's worth saying that in, a, in some ways, <laughs> pyramids had kind of been a dry run for Good Omens in that, um, <laughs> Thanks, John. Malcolm Edwards' jacket. <laughs> Terry owned the trousers, though. His trousers. Unspecified polo neck jumper. <laughs> Wonderful. Terry was freezing. <laughs> it was cold. I was just about OK, because I had a leather jacket, even though it's over a T-shirt. Um, Anyway, sorry. Um, <laughs> so we kind, we kind of done a weird dry run in that we kind of co-plotted and I'd had a lot of stuff on pyramids. Terry had sort of would ring me up every day and we'd talk about it. And then he'd go and tell me what he was doing now and, and just using me as a sort of a bouncing off ideas wall. Um, which was why I think when Terry said, you know, yeah, that, that thing, that 5,000 words you wrote that you sent me last year, are you doing anything with that? And I said, no, Terry. And he said, well, tell you what, either you can sell it to me and I'll write the book or we can do it together. And I am not stupid. And I was not <laughs> stupid then. Um, so I said, we will write it together. And he said, good. Um, let's do the business bit now. We split everything 50-50. And I said, you're all right. And he said, good, that was the business bit done. Um, yeah. It's the, bu the business outfit. Uh, oh, bless. That was us. Great so we, uh, Terry, um, Terry said, have you got the version, have you got that first 5,000 words on disc? And I said, no. Um, I got fried when my computer got struck by lightning. And he said, oh, well, then I'll just retype it in. And by the time he had finished retyping it in, it was now the first 10,000 words. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd taken this character I had of this demon called Crawley, who was a very English, awkward, kind of rather sweet demon who never did anything bad, and had reinvented him as two different characters. He'd sort of, he'd taken, basically he was just making fun of me back then <laughs> yes. for Crowley. And then he sort of took the other half of that demon and made him a zero fail. So he split this character into two characters and now we had an engine that took us through the book. Um, and we, Mostly, I mean, we were writing in two different ways. Terry was always the official guardian of the master disc because we were just scared that it would, that if we had two different versions of it, they would change. Um, and even though Terry was official guardian of the master disc, we did wind up with extra versions, which is, tells you a lot about us. Um, <laughs> but we would do it by you know, Terry would leave a message on my answering machine. I, this was a long time ago. <laughs> they, a tape, little blinking red light. Yep. 
and the message would, it was very, you know, there were, I mean, many of you have heard me do my impression of Terry's answering machine message, but in case you haven't, it went, get up, get up, you bastard, I've just written a good bit. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I would get up, and I'd play this when I did get up, and then I'd ring him, and he would read me whatever he'd written that morning, and I would read him whatever I had written at about one o'clock that same morning, and we'd make each other laugh, and then we'd plot. We'd talk about what was gonna happen next, and we'd talk about where things could go, and we'd come up with ideas, and it was a sort of strange communal process, and then it would be get back to work to write the next, get to the next good bit before the other one could. Mm. Yes. Um, and that was always the, the nature of the process. And we would send discs backwards and forwards weekly, I'm still trying to remember if by 1989 they were those three inch discs with a plastic coat on them or whether we were still on five inch discs that you had to put cardboard into the letter to stop the postman folding them <laughs> and um, when they put them through the letterbox. But that was how we did it. We once and once only, we each owned a modem it was a 300 slash 75 modem um, because it would uh, download things at 300 but upload at 75. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we managed to make these two modems talk to each other. It took us all evening yep, of course. <laughs> and we realized it actually would have been quicker to phone the other one and dictate and have the other one write <laughs> down slowly, letter by letter, possibly spelled out in Morse code. Yep. But we were so proud of ourselves for having got our modems to connect. We never did it again. No. Um, and then I went down at the, once we, once we finished the novel, I went down to Terry's and um, took everything with me that I'd written and he had everything and we just basically put the book together. That was the first time we discovered that the week had two Wednesdays in it. Um, <laughs> and I, I remember that first ever dinner Terry and I had and we took Rihanna with us and Terry showed off very proudly that Rihanna, who I think was about 12 at that point, was a member of the Just William fan club. <laughs> and um, because uh, back then, the, that first draft of Good Omens was still called William the Antichrist. <laughs> and it was still a Just William book with demons and angels and things. And then I think we may have tried to make a phone call to find out if we could actually get the rights to make it a Just William book. But I also think that there was a point where we went you know, if it wasn't a Just William book, and we sort of just file off a few of the serial numbers, <laughs> we could have a bit more fun mm. with it. And the idea of having more fun on the second draft. So the second draft, um, we filed off all the serial numbers, and uh, we did a search and replace for the name William and changed it to Adam all the way through. So Vaughan Williams, the composer, became Vaughan Adams. <laughs> <laughs> Which really confused the people at Golanx. They're like, we have never heard of this composer, Vaughan Adams, that you are talking about. What did he do? Fill us in on Vaughan Adams. Um, but, um, you know, that, I, I, the weirdest bit, the one moment that I remember as being the strangest, most quintessentially writing Good Omens Together moment was when we had to copy edit it. And we copy edited it in the basement of Victor Golanx, which at that point was in 14 Henrietta Street. And the basement was a basement. There were chairs down there, no tables or anything. So we're sitting in these card chairs in this my recollection is it did have a carpet and the carpet was kind of damp. Yeah. <laughs> you know, beneath that carpet, there was sort of strange puddles of mm. publishing. Um, <laughs> and Terry and I just sat there and we were both 
copy editing away. And then there was a point where Terry looked up and chuckled like anything. I said, what are you chuckling about? He said, that joke you put in. I said, which one? Because, you know, you want to hear which one. He read it out. I said, I didn't write that one. <laughs> and he said, well, I didn't write it. <laughs> and at that point, you could yep. tell from our eyes, both of us had come to the conclusion that perhaps the manuscript was generating itself. It's okay. <laughs> and neither of us was prepared to say this out loud for fear of being thought a bit odd. <laughs> um, Rob, you've had a fairly full-on year, not just with the anniversary, but also touring the biography and talking not just about Terry's life and all of the wonderful things and all of the challenges of working with Terry, which become beautifully apparent throughout. But you've also had this incredibly full-on and really difficult responsibility of talking like quite over and over again about the last few years of his life and that ending and everything. And I was just wondering, have you had any therapy? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, sitting with you on stage at Waterstones Piccadilly that first time in the church next door, it was, um, it was so lovely. Because, and I wanted to leave the stage and just sit in the audience and listen to you talk about the book. Um, because it, it, that was my therapy. And I'm, I'm, I'm not blowing smoke. That first moment. Nobody would have paid to see that. <laughs> no, I would. Um, that was my therapy. It was the it was the full stop at the end yeah. of a life with footnotes. And now, deep breath. It's there. It's been published. We can now celebrate it. And it was that was the tipping point for me. It was right. It's taking the album out on the road, isn't it? And and it just felt a very real moment. Then um, I've got to accept. It's the same with our documentaries. The, 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 the evening that our documentaries would be broadcast, I was a complete nightmare at home because I would be believing that everybody, not just in Great Britain, um, would, but in the entire world, was tuned into BBC Two, and everybody tomorrow would judge me. Um, and I felt the same with Life With Footnotes, that it could only be the book that it, it, it is, and everyone would, would judge me. And uh, I wanted it to be... I wanted people to hear Terry's voice. I wanted people to hear my voice, people who knew me well, um, uh, and there's many of them here tonight. I would, I, that's what I wanted, mm. that they could hear me telling the story, and, and, it, and that's how it was received. But actually, <laughs> let's go back to audio, recording the audio book for it. Now, you've, you've, you have a little uh, studio at home in, in New York. Um, I recorded the audio of the Life with Footnotes, and it's 16 and a half hours long, and... It took me eight and a half days to record that. It was, um, yes, I, I, I've never been through childbirth, but I imagine it was <laughs> as hard as childbirth. Um, uh, uh, certainly, as, certainly it was harder than coal mining or anything like that. It was really <laughs> tough getting that story out. Um, but I did it, and I got to the end. And just when you feel that you've done a good job and you think, yep, we, we've done it, um, Graham, my driver, who is sitting in the audience tonight, said, yeah, it's, it's all right, it's all right, because he's, you know, he's obviously my, my biggest critic. He said, but I could tell when you've had your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I said, how do you work that out? And he said, I can hear you starting to sag. And then, then suddenly, oh, Rob's back in the room again at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> and I, I like that. I thought there's a real honesty to that. There, there, it's me. I'm reading it. Yeah. There, there you go. Plus also, we just continual snacks and feeding. I should have brought something on stage. This That's fine. Terrible. I've got my gin and tonic. I'm fine. <laughs> I, I loved the book, and I thought you deserved your Hugo, and I thought it was fabulous. There is still part of me that goes, I hope in my lifetime one day somebody does that five-volume <laughs> Terry Pratchett biography, you know, the, the big heavy one in all the volumes that just really dives deep into everything, because I think Terry deserves it. And I felt like what you did was brilliant. I thought it was accessible. And I also thought it was incredibly honest and accurate. But it goes so fast. It's like, look, Terry's a best-selling author now. <laughs> now he's, he's you know, president of the Society of Authors. Now he's getting knighted. And I'm like, slow down. <laughs> I, I would love to have got into some of that stuff in granular detail while also getting into granular detail on what he was writing what day and what he was thinking because because you know the the time i spent with terry 
I learned so much from that man. Mm. Oh, um, likewise. No and, it, and, you know, miss him. There is not a day goes by that I do not in some way wind up going, I, I wish you were here. I need to check this with you. Mm. I, what would you think about this? I'm doing this. Is that okay? I'm out of my depth on this. Just, you know, that, that point where I would, you know, I, I cheerfully brag about Terry phoning me up and saying, I've got these two, is this funny or is this funnier? And I would say, well, you know, you can do both. And he'd say, how? And I said, well, you do this and that. And he said, oh, you're right, <laughs> click. And yeah. I know he's off writing. Um, but I used to do the same to him. And I would say, Terry, I can't figure out this plot thing. And he would say, what, what is your problem? And I would say, well, this is where I am in the thing. And he would always say something that would make me want to kick him. Like, <laughs> you do understand, grasshopper. <laughs> <laughs> he would begin. There was an awful lot of grasshopper. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You do understand, grasshopper, that the nature of the solution is encased in the way you phrase the problem. <laughs> And I'm like, just tell me what to do, Terry. <laughs> um, and I miss him. I do. Yeah. This isn't even the visual metaphor. I mean, Terry's sitting on my shoulder like this. This is how I work every day. Uh, I, everything that I do, every decision I have to make, I have to run it past the Terry sitting on my shoulder. Mm. And that's why, actually, Tiffany Aching's guide was such a joy, because the responsibility wasn't with me, it, um, uh, it, was, it, was, it was all on Rihanna's shoulders, and I mean that most affectionately. I mean, can you imagine the responsibility of opening those doors and stepping into not just her father's world, but an incredibly successful world that, that, that has sold 100 million books worldwide? That's incredibly brave for her to do, to do that. Whether she feels the same about him sitting there, I, I hope not. I, I think Rihanna's got big enough shoulders that, in fact, she can shoulder it on, on her own. But yeah. I still feel it every day. And, and, I, and I'm sure that we miss the same Terry, but we also have to accept that it's really He was bad. her dad. It's a very yeah. different it thing. Is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, for me, he was my friend and collaborator. Yeah. For Rob, he was his boss yeah. and collaborator. Um, I, I, I felt it most in season one of... Good omens, because I am, as Rob will tell you, fundamentally, I tend to be sort of affable and agreeable. Mm -hmm. And I will fundamentally, you know, if somebody says, this is what we're doing, I will go, well, I can see the logic in that. And I'm not going to put up a fuss. And on Good Omens, season one, I would have written things in the script. Mm -hmm. And I would have, I would know whether I was writing a Neil scene or a Terry scene. And I remember doing the death of Agnes Nutter, which was pure Terry. That was, Terry, Terry grumbled to me once that, you know, really he should have kept Agnes for a Discworld novel, but he'd, he'd put her into Good Omens because she worked there, but he'd, he'd given up something he could have had in Discworld. I was like, pretty grateful, Terry. So the death of Agnes Nutter, where she gets blown up, um, and I take an enormous pleasure in writing that scene, going, you will get such a kick out of this, Terry. And um, then we were told by the producers one day, they said, you know, the, the, we're having some budget shortfall issues. And uh, we think we've figured out how to solve them. And you've written this whole sequence with the giant bonfire, and it's all set in the past, and you've got hundreds of extras in the 1640s, and we're have to, gonna have to go down to Southampton to this ancient village to film it all, and it's gonna cost millions. And what if we did it with prints? And a narrator can just explain, as we see these woodcut yes. prints, uh, the death of Agnes Nutter. And the Neil Gaiman in me is like, well, I can see that would save 2.1 million pounds, and we really need to, and we're over budget, and I, I get that point, and okay, it's Prince, and maybe we can animate the Prince a little bit, and the Terry Pratchett over my shoulder said things that were frankly not printable. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah. it was just like, that is not gonna happen, and I turned to them and I said, I'm afraid not. We're just gonna have to figure out 
how we get the money. And at that point, um, I, I basically, I conferred with Rob. And I said, what if we do a script book? And I will give all of my share of the money to the production. You can give all your share. I think we can guilt trip the BBC. If we're both giving up our shares, we can guilt trip the BBC into giving up their share. <laughs> and it can just all go into the production. And I bet we could get an advance that would cover the cost of shooting that scene. And that was what we did. Yeah. Um, but it was done because I knew that Terry, you know, Terry gave me this job of go make good omens. And the way that he said it, he phrased it, it was just like, you've got, he, he basically said, look, you've got to make this. I, we were going to do this together, and now I can't. Yes. So you have to make this, because you are the only other person who cares for the old girl as much as I do. The old girl, in this case, being good omens. He said, and I want to see it. And you have to make it so that I can see it. And then he died, which meant He's never going to see it, which meant I have to make it for him anyway. And he's more critical from the other side, sitting on his <laughs> back, than he ever was in real life. Absolutely. Yeah, he tells me off more from the other side. <laughs> on that note, ladies and gentlemen, Rob Wilkins, Neil Gaiman, Terry Pratchett. <laughs> Thank you to John Fawcett at the British Library for putting together this frankly hilarious and wonderful slideshow of photographs. <laughs> um, we're going to go on to questions now. We've got some mics that will be... Ah, wonderful, mics going. Um, can I please just do a customary beg slash um, I will stop you otherwise uh, to say that please do a question, not a comment. <laughs> the one-part <laughs> question is always preferred to the yes. two-part question. Thank you. Right. Short, uh, and, and just so because yesterday some people <laughs> hadn't quite got this short thing that you say that ends in a question mark <laughs> that we can answer from the stage. Yeah. We now have the definition. This is perfect. Um, gentleman in the black T-shirt, just there. Oh, I feel like an auctioneer. Thanks very much. Um, Neil, you talked a lot about use of IT. Um, you know, discs or the rest of it. What was the? W there must have been something that went wrong during all of that. Was there a, a terrible incident where like, a disc went away, away in a post or something? You know, we were relatively lucky. Um, there were definite. There weren't any. What there weren't were any awful discs getting lost, um, discs getting corrupted things breaking, uh, we didn't have any of that. What we did have was because we were both writing away very enthusiastically, uh, when we came to glue the story together and get together and actually just sort of put all the stuff that we'd written in order, there was a lot of finding out that the days of the week did not work. And we fixed it once, we thought, really, really proudly. And then when the Golanx book was published, um, it was bought by Workman's in America. And Workman said, you know, you've just written it as one text from beginning to end. Could you break it up into chapters? And we said, no, nope, not doing chapters. And they said, well, could you do it? What if you broke it up in a days? And we'll say, great, we'll do that. So we had, you know, 4,000 years, 6,000 years ago, and then we had 11 years ago, and then we went Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And that was the point where we discovered that somehow we still had two Wednesdays. <laughs> if you go through the Golanx edition, there, you, you have a two Wednesday week. Um, and that was following the excision of two Tuesdays, so <laughs> just feel faintly embarrassed about that. I will I also say the funny thing about Terry was um, Terry always used to make me feel very lazy as a writer because he would not stop. 
and did not stop. And the point where he and I got together and we did a bunch of extra stuff for the American edition, all of which we then decided that we liked because it was extra stuff, Terry just kept going. <laughs> and, and I get a phone call from him saying, oh, I've just written this whole bit about flavors of ice cream in America. And I'm like, they've already bought the book, tell. <laughs> but can I tell them the, the, the um, this has nothing to do with things going wrong, but um, the auction. Yeah, go for it. OK, so oh. <laughs> <laughs> you need to understand that until the good omens, Terry is very happy. He's just retired from working as a publicist for the electricity board because um, he's now getting paid, was it £20,000 a book? Yes. So he's getting paid about £20,000 a book, but he's thrilled. <coughs> and Good Omens, we decide it's going to go to auction. We wrote it on spec. We wrote it for fun. So it's not under that contract of Terry's. And my agent goes out to auction. And lots of publishers want it. And it is very rapidly over 20,000. And Terry phones me up. And he says, it's 30,000 pounds. I said, yeah. He said, that's wonderful, isn't it? And I said, yeah. And then I get a phone call from Terry about an hour later saying, it's, it's 75,000 pounds. And I said, yeah, that's great. And he said, yeah. <laughs> then I get a phone call from Terry about half an hour after that saying, it, it's over 100,000 pounds. And he sounds very somber and serious. And I say, yes. <laughs> and he says, we have to call it off. <laughs> and I said, what? He said, we have to stop. I said, why? He said, well, this is a disaster. <laughs> and I said, why is it a disaster? <laughs> I think this is the best news I've ever heard. I think this is <laughs> completely wonderful. It's still going up. It appears to be at 120,000 right now. And he's like, no, no, stop it. And I said, why? He said, well, it won't sell all those books. It's going to come out. They'll have paid a lot for it. I will become one of those authors who gets an advance they cannot recoup, and I'll never be able to make my 20,000 pounds a book again. <laughs> and he was completely serious. And I just said, Terry, it's OK. If this book does not sell, does not earn back, does not recoup, they can blame me. <laughs> and you can blame me. And everyone will go, well, if it had been a Terry Pratchett solo book, it would have done. But this idiot <laughs> ruined it. And Terry was like, yeah, all right. <laughs> Uh, this lady here, second in on the second row, please. Hello. Um, my question is about Good Omens, and I understand that you came up with the idea for the second book while you were sort of touring the first book. Um, and I was I, one. Sorry. I was <laughs> going to say it was. Before, please ask the question, then I'll. I'll <laughs> I was wondering, when you were making the second TV series, how much of that was a part of what you came up with with Terry, and how much of it is just sort of trying to get to what you came up with, Terry? So that's a really good question. So um, actually, it was before the book was published. It was um, 1989. The Seattle World Fantasy Convention, the um, World Fantasy Convention was being held in Seattle over Halloween. Terry and I were sharing a room to keep the costs down, which tells you a lot about the era, <laughs> because in his later year, Terry would buy the hotel before he got there and have it painted. <laughs> um, And Terry being, it's, it was Saturday night, Terry had pleaded jet lag and had gone off to bed at like 9.30 or 10. 
And I had not pleaded jet lag and stayed up drinking and talking and generally carousing until about one o'clock in the morning. Then I went up to the room. Back in those days, they had these things called keys. <laughs> turn the key as quietly as you can. And I took off my shoes in the corridor yep. so that I could tiptoe through the room to go to my bed got through the room and I was really proud of the fact that I'd been doing this completely silently and I sat down on the bed and a little voice from the other end of the room said, what time of the night do you call this thing? <laughs> Your mother and I have been worried sick about it. <laughs> and Terry was wide awake and the jet lag had sort of got to him. So, we lay in our respective beds and just wound up talking about what the sequel would be. And we plotted it and kept plotting it. And we had everything except the ending. Uh, we did have the title. Uh, it was going to be called 668, The Neighbor of the Beast. <laughs> and um, a title which one year later at the Chicago World Fantasy Convention on a panel with so on funny fantasy, we told the panelists and the audience. And they all thought it was funny, and none laughed longer or louder than the person who, uh, eight months after that, put out a book called 668, The Neighbor of the Beast, um, which Terry, uh, Terry was very grumpy about that. <laughs> um, I was a little bit grumpy, but um, so, we had a plot, and then in 2006, we wound up at the Audi Awards, and I think I was hosting the awards, and Terry was up for an award, or Terry won an award, or got, but we were sitting next to each other, and again, we got very bored, and when Terry and I would get bored, we'd plot Good Omen stuff, so we plotted the end of Good Omens at that point, um, and in answer to your question, how much of that got into Good Omens season two, there are a number of answers and they're all true, one of which would be none. Um, it's all getting us into place for that storyline, which would be season three. But it's also true that a lot of the stuff that's in season one and in season two that is not in the book, particularly all the heaven stuff, um, was all set up for stuff that we'd plotted. One of the things we got really into for the sequel was going to be heaven and angels, and we had a whole plot with them and some hell stuff. So a lot of what I added in, where people were going, why is he doing all this then? In season one was set up for that stuff. The problem that I realized when I came, because I, so the deal with Terry that I had made was I will do, I'll tell Good Omens and I'll finish the story. We have this story. When Terry and I got together with Rob to have our 2010 celebratory sushi dinner in Cardiff. Because um, you were working on the... I was working on the Doctor's Wife, yes. my Doctor Who episode. And Terry drove in, well, Bob drove Terry in. Um, and we had celebratory sushi and champagne, and that was the point where Terry said, and we're gonna do the, we'll, we'll do the, the second story, and we'll finish it, we'll finish the story. And I'm like, oh, really? And he's like, yes. Um, and that became part of the thing. The problem was that in a lot of ways it's too similar to the first um, to have gone straight into it. Going from season one into that story, I felt like everybody would be going, well, this is the same thing. And I loved the idea of going, okay, let's do it as, as a sandwich. Let's do it as a three-act thing which means I need lots of soft, squashy stuff to go in my Armageddon sandwich. 
Um, so really, season two is me making up a giant, soft, squashy. I kept describing it to people as gentle and romantic. And they're all like, how could you say that, you evil person? And I'm like, I thought it was gentle and romantic. I mean, for me, it's gentle and romantic. Um, I can promise you, season three is not gentle or romantic. So, um, so it, but it is a sort of... Is that, that season three that we don't know is ha happening yet? It is season three that the... I, I need to clarify something, because the word has gone out that it's been greenlit. Um, and what has actually been greenlit at this point is me writing the scripts. <laughs> I have been commissioned to write the scripts. We are still waiting on tenterhooky tenterhooks. Um, for I, I, I've been told we are only a couple of virtual clicks away, but those clicks have not yet been clicked. So when they are, the world will know. There you go. You've heard it here first. <laughs> Lovely. Um, a lady in the sunglasses just here. <laughs> Realise it's no helpful to somebody coming down the aisle. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Terry had a habit of referencing people he knew in real life in the books. There's a certain Rob Anybody and a certain Wilkins, various others. That wasn't me. That's mm -hmm. not, Willikins is not me. So. Really? Really, yes. Willikins preceded me by, by a number of years, yeah. The more you know. So what you're saying is Terry created you. <laughs> <laughs> Terry and Jilly Cooper. <laughs> yes, indeed. <yeah. laughs> Terry, was, Terry was so pleased to have Rob work. I, he phoned me up one day. The phone rings. And it's like, hello, have you got an assistant? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, I've had an assistant for years now. He said... I've got an assistant. <laughs> he said, he looks like a grown-up Harry Potter. <laughs> Sorry, please finish your question. <laughs> I mean, you can keep going if you like. But, um, and of course, there's Crowley, and I don't know how you did the sunglasses, because these are killing me. <laughs> um, but, so he put people he liked into the books, but when you read the books, who do you identify with in them, mm. and why? Oh, oh, um, uh, 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 I can hear Terry at the point, in the later books, the books that I was there for, I, I, I hear Terry. But the way that they were written is that we could bolt somebody into a character who actually has no physical attributes, no metaphysical attributes to the character, but it would be, very, it would be easy for us to visualise... Um, I'm going to actually admit who it is. Glenda in, uh, in Unseen Academicals was Philippa Dickinson, our editor, and the, who bears no resemblance in any way to anything about Glenda. But it, it was we then had a shortcut into Glenda. Yeah. And I can only talk for Terry in this. I don't know if every author does this, but that was our shortcut in. So I hear Terry. And so more than, more than anything, I hear his voice because I was blessed to be at his side as the Discworld books were being dictated to me. And I, if it wasn't happening to me, I would be jealous of myself. Um, <laughs> so, yes, good question. But, yeah, I hear Terry's voice. I mean, the, the character, obviously, that I kind of identified with just because Terry created him to make fun of me <laughs> was Crowley. Um, <laughs> because Terry had much too much fun going, here are all of the things about Neil that I think are hilarious. <laughs> like my habit of wearing sunglasses even when you didn't need them. Yeah. Um, exactly. So he just put them in, in the book. And then I got to write most of the Crowley in the book, which even got, got really strange. Um, but one of the things that I loved doing with Terry, we didn't do it in Good Omens with people but we would do it occasionally with um, characters from long forgotten British TV comedies. Okay. <laughs> Is we'd go, let's make it him. So um, in our heads, for example, Sergeant Shadwell looked like Wilfred Bramble as Old Man Steptoe. Yes, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> In Our Heads, uh, Newt was based on the young Derek Nimmo as Newt, 
the, um, in all gas and gators, um, for example. And there isn't anything really of those characters in there, but it was just giving us a visual thing yep. that we could hold on to that we then, in each case, abandoned fairly quickly. But it was a good thing but once the, that character's then on the, on, the, on the stage, as it were, on the stage and on the page, then they've taken a life of their own. Exactly. Yeah. They, they stop being that and start being something, start being themselves. Yeah. But it was just a nice sort of place, a visual place to start. Mm. Good question. Uh, third row, please. Right at the end. Sorry, I'm really making you exercise. Hello, hello, a, hello, a hello. microphone. Hi. Oh. Sorry, I was just waiting for my mic to warm up. I was wondering if we could take a question from online while the mic gets down to yep, row great. number three. Um, this is a lovely reminder that we are streaming to libraries tonight and the fantasy exhibition is taking place in public libraries because Melanie asks, what do you think about the power or impact that libraries have on our society nowadays? Would you like to share a personal library story and what was Terry's relationship like with libraries? It, it's a, that's a, a very, very good question, and it's actually a very brief answer. Uh, Terry said that school taught him basically how to spit, how to fight and spit, um, and he got his formal education in the in Beaconsfield Public Library. I mean, that's that's what libraries meant to Terry. That he had. I'll have to turn to Neil now to confirm how many library cards did he have at one point. I mean, it was it was a lot. It, he had an obscene number of library cards. <laughs> And he was one of the first people to really explain to me the power of the interlibrary loan. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I not surprised? Yes. Um, no, Terry loved libraries. Terry loved librarians. Um, and um, not carnally. <laughs> <laughs> Just, it was a spiritual thing. Um, and he took them out for dinner first. <laughs> it was... And, you know, I, I, I think it was one of the, the places that Terry and I sort of bonded on was I was stumbling around in the world in my 20s going, I don't think any of the big important things that I learned in school, um, like geography, differential calculus, <laughs> are actually things that are making any difference to my life. But I think those hours that I spent in the school library and those hours that I spent in my local library um, and all of those books I read seem to be incredibly important. And I, they seem to be an enormous part of who I am and what I do. And um, as far as I'm concerned right now, in particularly you know, in, in the UK, libraries are just under attack from underfunding. And it's heartrending that you get councils closing down libraries because they claim they can't afford them. Um, in America, libraries are under attack from people who think that libraries are a very bad and dangerous idea because they can expose people to things that they might not have thought before. And you're getting things like local library boards packed with people who need to keep children away from dangerous things like books voting to close down their own library rather than allow people to take books out. Honestly, I'm not sure which is worse. Um, it feels to me like both approaches are criminal, painful, and wrong. Libraries are vital, they're important, and they're where you get the likes of a Terry Pratchett let loose in the world from. Do you know whether there'll be any more Terry Pratchett short stories and if he might have had any other eight other names in his books? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, uh, afterwards, Pat and Jan Harkin, who are here in the front row. They just, uh, 
The, the finding of the short stories is a story we probably haven't got time to tell tonight, but honestly, corner them, and Pat and Jan will, 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 will tell you how the, how the finding of the st short stories came about. Um, but I was on my way to the, uh, the illustrious, um, most illustrious, uh, Taunton Literary Festival. Um, have you been to the Taunton Literary Festival? I have not. You haven't peaked yet. Uh, <laughs> you'll, 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 you'll get there one day. Don't worry, it'll be, it'll, it'll, it'll be OK. We did. We got there. Um, I got a phone call from the, another gentleman in the front row, Colin Smythe, Terry's um, original publisher and agent. <laughs> who pointed out that of all the short stories that were sent off to the publisher, he might just have forgotten to send them one. <laughs> and this isn't a marketing ploy. So in, in, the brief answer to your question is, the paperback, not a marketing ploy, definitely not. There will be one more short story in there that found its way into the hardback. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> Wonderful. We've got time for one super fast last question. So yes, this lady in, in third row. Hello. Um, I just wanted to go back to the literary influences, and I wanted to ask about um, if Terry ever read the Grodetsky brothers, particularly Monday Starts on Saturday, and how much of an influence was it on him? Because I read it recently uh, for the first time, and I immediately like, this is Terry Pratchett, except it was written in the 60s. So I was just like... I, I mean, Terry had read everything, especially anything. <laughs> I, I mean, Terry was about the most widely read human being I've ever encountered. You can take it as read that if it was science fiction and printed before 1980-ish, Terry had read it. Mm. Um, you can also assume that if it was crime fiction and printed before about 1995, Terry had read it. Um, he'd read all of the classic fantasy. He, and then he'd read all of the weird stuff that you couldn't possibly imagine that Terry would have read. Because, and sometimes he just read it because he wanted to check out the opposition. You know, who else was <laughs> on the bestseller lists and was there any point to that? Um, he felt it was like a gumbo that you, you, you by taking a, a, a ladle full out and putting it in your cup, actually, with what you then create from it, is actually topping up yeah. the vat uh, with your own work. There, there was definitely, I loved Terry's, Terry's stew analogy yeah. um, because essentially what Terry was saying is as a young writer, you are the sum of all your influences. And you kind of owe it to the world to read as much as you can, mm -hmm. to learn as much as you can, to be influenced by everything. And you're doing the equivalent of taking a ladle and plunging it into an existing stew. And then, as a writer, you're going to be sort of adding carrots and tomatoes and dill to the stew. Yeah. Um, and then, that stew is going to get ladled back into the pot, and the pot will bubble on after you've gone, but now it's going to have you in it, and what you've added to the stew, your Pratchetty tomatoes <laughs> and your dill, are going to change the flavor of the stew for everybody forever. Um, and now, when young writers come, and ladle out the stew, you'll be in there. Is that an accurate? I like that a lot. I like that a lot. If you looked at uh, Terry's shelves in his own personal library, and in fact, one thing I should make absolutely clear, that he was incredibly proud of his knighthood, but in fact, he was, he was prouder that he had actually been able to build his own library, uh, and that, that, was a, that was a big deal to him. Um, where he had all of the bound copies of Punch magazine, where he had... Um, copies of, of, um, of Brewers going back decades. Uh, Terry reading Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable, like, he read it like a novel, didn't he? He started off at A and read through to Z. He, he didn't realise that that isn't what you were meant I'm a, well, to do. Well, but it is what you're meant to do. I mean, Terry and I would, we would bond on Brewers. Occasionally I get phone calls from him saying, yeah, I've discovered a new Brewers. <laughs> Have you read his Dictionary of Miracles, imitative... Oh, gosh, what were the, there was a list of descriptions. And it's like, no, I did not know that the Reverend E. Cobham Brewer had done a Dictionary of Miracles. Yep. Right, I'm sending you a copy tomorrow, he'd say. <laughs> uh, 
and, and three days later, a copy of the Reverend E. Cobham Brewer's Dictionary of Miracles would turn up at my house with a note from Terry just saying, you need this. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, so that's our reading list sorted for, yes. like, before until Christmas. And just what a, a lovely, lovely note to end on. But firstly, just thank you to everybody for coming, for wonderful questions, but above all, to Rob Wilkins, Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett.